Okay, I, I think it's time to get started. Uh, at least here, it's it's pretty late, past midnight. Um, so this is Yari, and uh, I am late working group because Stephen has a family issue and may join us late. So I started the call, and um, uh, Stephen has posted an agenda, which we will uh, uh, follow. Um, of course, if you have comments on the agenda, we can, we can reshuffle that. And uh, I have turned on recording. Uh, hopefully, that's okay with everybody. Uh, please yell if, if not. You just have to uh, take some notes afterwards. Although I'll, I'll try and take also some light notes, uh, but not that the detail level that we can do when, when we have the recording on. So, no comments on the agenda. So Stephen's agenda said uh, we would do basically three things. Uh, one, um, do around the table status updates or introductions. Not that we need introductions per se, but um, you know, uh, if, if you have an update on what you've been at, up to recently in recent weeks, then please give us that uh, or have a burning thing in your mind that we have to solve this, please tell us. Um, and then we should talk about the way forward, uh, in particular, like how do we, we have lots of text and lots of people writing different things. How do we move forward and actually get something done that I think would be useful to talk about? And then uh, what to do next in terms of meetings and so forth. So starting with the uh, intro status updates and uh, I actually try and do this, call people's names, make sure that uh, we go through everybody. You don't have to say something if you have nothing to report, but uh, I'll just go by the order that I have on my screen. And we'll start with uh, Colin. Um, hi, yeah, uh, Colin Perkins from the University of Glasgow. Uh, I am mostly just here to observe and see what's going on in this uh, group. Thank you. And uh, Dominique, you're next. Hi, uh, Dominique. Uh, it's August in the UK, so most of us are on holiday. <laughs> so not a lot has been done um, yet. But I just wanted to thank you, Yari, for um, the comments that I just received on the on the email list. I noticed you sent out a number of comments, including on your own document. So that was good, and um, it was it was really good, actually, really really helpful for me. And uh, just want to make sure that we, you know, kind of figure out how those documents fit into moving forward. What we're going to do next. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Dominique. Uh, and then Ira. Sorry, finding the mute. Ira McDonald. Um, consultant in the uh, Toyota um, Global Vehicle Security Team. And um, I'm like Colin and some others probably um, listening in to learn more about this. I've been following the mailing list and reading some of the um, documents as I could. Thanks. And uh... And then uh, Jeffrey. Hi, this is Jeffrey Yaskin. Um, I'm working on the privacy threat model that uh, Sam Weiler mentioned in your last meeting, and he he suggested that I that I pay attention to this. So I'm uh, mostly listening and and trying to read your documents. Uh, great, uh, welcome, and I'll uh, I'll jump back to Christian. Oh wait, uh, you may not be. Yes, are so we you able to speak it. Yes, you are. Sorry, I was uh, almost ready to get uh, lunch, and then I realized that I had to join you. So I'm here. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry about your lunch. Uh, yeah, so we're in sort of status report round. So if you have any particular things you want to mention, um, that would be a good time.
Christian, you're muted if you wanted to say something. Oh, okay. I'm Christian Wittema. Uh, I've been following the Model T walk from the beginning, and uh, I am not spending as much time as I would like on it, but I'm still following and trying to, to get there. Okay, thanks. And then uh, Joe S. or Joe's? Is this Joe's yeah, Alloway? this is uh, Joe Salloway. Yeah, sorry, I, my uh, WebEx uh, name is not as clear as it should be. Um, yeah, I'm, I have nothing new to report. Uh, just trying to catch up on what's going on here. All right, and then Mark. Hi, um, it's Mark McFadden. Uh, I have a couple updated drafts, one on uh, changes to the threat model and uh, another one that I sent to uh, the MAP uh, research group. It's a piece of work that does a, a statistical analysis of words and security consideration sections. And um, it's an interesting piece of work that sort of, I think, speaks to the Model T work, but kind of obliquely. So uh, those are the two updates I have. Thanks, Gary. Thank you. We, uh, the, the other draft, um, you had a change these on, on uh, threat model, um, but the other one, uh, this wasn't, uh, this was something else than the, uh, the terminology draft. What was the so, file name of the draft? Right. So there's really three drafts in play. There's one that's about the uh, changes to the threat environment. There's one on the endpoint taxonomy draft that I did update in July. And then I was just calling to your attention, and I won't talk a lot about it, but um, a piece of work that a uh, co-author and I did on taking a look at uh, word counts in security consideration sections and seeing how they've changed since 2003. So those are the three I was talking about. Thanks, Gary. All right, thanks. And uh, Martin. Uh, Martin Thompson. Uh, I've been following since the beginning. I've got a draft that I submitted. Um, we've discussed a little bit, but um, nothing's happened since we last met. And unfortunately, I was sleeping when Yari said his emails, and I haven't read them yet. All right, uh, and Russ. So I've also been uh, following this group since the beginning. Um, I have not yet read Yari's emails from not that long ago. <laughs> um, but uh, otherwise, I think I'm up to date on the list. But nothing new to report. All right, and uh, Tommy. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Tommy C from NCSC. Um, so I've been following this work from the beginning. I'm interested to see where it is um, developing from today. Um, I'm also looking how NCSC can bring more of our work on attack defense in um, to build on the indicators of compromise work that we have done thus far. So I think this is very exciting. Thanks, and uh, Wendy. Uh, yes, Wendy Seltzer, W3C, uh, following this work mostly to, uh, and working to to bring it uh, to uh, W3C and uh, ideas from there here, uh, vice versa, including uh, the, the work that, that Jeffrey is, uh, is doing on uh, threat models. Um, and we've recently uh, seen uh, it's some new work uh, on uh, privacy protective uh, features uh, incubating in a uh, relatively new uh, privacy community group uh, at W3C. Yeah, and I can go last, but before that, do I miss anybody? I guess not. So um, updates. Yeah, there's been some 
some email updates, perhaps. Uh, so I did some reviews and uh, be mostly thinking about like how to move forward. And uh, as usual with the ITF, it's you know, maybe not so much about like adding stuff, but uh, making sure that that uh, we actually have a sort of consistent story piece that could be published and uh, has the necessary pieces, but not not uh, too much else. And um, yeah, I guess we can talk about that in in a bit. And uh, otherwise, not much on my side has happened either since the previous informal meeting during ITF 108. I've been on vacation, and uh, yeah, now back and uh, have to do some work. So. Here we are. Um, yeah, so so maybe the next item then is what Stephen had suggested that we talk about the, the way forward. And um, and I, I guess his uh, point of view was that, that we're heading towards two different things. One, trying to offer the ITF some text as a possible update of PCP38. Or maybe some other document too. And secondly, writing uh, some background documents that explain um, the motivation for that, or or maybe uh, it's just the motivation, but it could also be other things like uh, you know, guidelines on how to deal with specific issues and so forth. But the general thrust seems to be that, that we would have like two two separate pieces of work. One one is something that we could send off to the ITF. We don't decide um, on, on this PCP changes, obviously it's the ITF's uh, turf, but, but we could certainly send a document or individuals could send a document and say, hey, let's let's look at this on the ITF side. Um, so that's one. And then the second one would be this background in, uh, information, maybe a, a um, summary of, of this or summary of, uh, of uh, different kinds of issues to take into account, or or something like that, and uh, of which we have several candidates right now, several documents had in that space. So I guess the first question is whether this this kind of direction from Stephen's email is is a reasonable direction, like a two prong approach. Going forward. Well, if you have thoughts, please speak up. We are, we are a small group today, so so you can just speak up. So Yari, it's Mark. I'll, I'll speak up just you know, because there was silence there for a second. As far as the two pronged approach goes, I, I actually think that's a good idea because I think the authors of some of the drafts that talk about the threat models um, can sort of meet one of the goals that was in the charter, right? Um, is in that the second bullet of deliverables in the charter says that one of the things we're going to do is uh, produce a document that. Uh, takes a look at how BCP 72 either matches or doesn't match today's reality. I think we have a lot of input on that. And I think that, you know, bringing the authors together to try to come up with a, a common, a common statement that then can get transmitted to the IETF is a good result, not only for model T, but that's a good result for the IAB. Um, I don't think we're in a position, and I, and I would argue against uh, offering text to the ITF at this point that is an actual update to BCP 72. I don't I don't think we're even close to that yet. But the two pronged approach seems reasonable to me. And the the second thing I would say about it is that I think we have some documents already that if we brought them together, edited edited them so that they were, um, let's say, a little a little stricter, a little a little more concise, uh, I think that would be very good input uh, to the security area in the IETF.
Okay. Uh, other people. Yeah, Yari, yeah, this is Dominique. I was going <laughs> to, I was unmuting as Mark was unmuting. Um, I, yeah, I do, I do support the two prong approach. And similarly, just, I only briefly looked at your comments because you sent them about 20 minutes before. Um, and I too was uh, resting <laughs> before the call. But basically, I think the 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 content we have quite a lot of content and and I think one of the comments that you had was was on focusing and I think along the same lines as Mark's comment, if we take. All of that together and focus a lot of the the research and the input and the information and the editing that needs to be done that can inform the second part of it, but I think. Um, you know, we're, we're not quite yet at that point where we can do an update um, to BCP 72, uh, but I do think we have a lot of, we have a lot of information and we have a lot of, you know, sort of people thinking about it. We have seven drafts obviously as well. And now also the um, uh, W3C is participating. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to, to hearing more from them, but I think we're at a point where we're, gathering and, and consolidating information in a way that reflects the current um, security information that can then inform the next step after that. Thanks. Thank you. Christian, yeah, please. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, having a taxonomy of uh, the, the threats uh, is a really good idea. And uh, I like uh, Dominique's uh, draft on that because, I mean, things like uh, botnet, phishing, uh, network penetrations uh, is something that we have to be concerned and it have to be uh, out there. Too much of the threat model that we have now is focused on just uh, addressing the direct communication between two points and not looking at the network effects is is a bad idea so first having the threat out there and say hey yes this thing is happening i mean you, you, we we have to be concerned about it what seems to be i mean the, there are little details in dominic's draft that i uh, i would like to to see i mean a bit uh, uh, i would say expanded on uh, one is uh, our use of uh, network attack which is uh, very ambiguous in an IETF context because uh, network attack in, a, in an IETF context uh, means attack on the routers, typically. And that's not what we are speaking about. We are speaking about uh, typically an attack that uh, culminates in something like breaching uh, the uh, Active Directory for the site or something like that. So it's basically attacking a community rather than attacking a piece of hardware. And and so that that should probably be uh, expanded a little bit on. Uh, the other thing that uh, I I I like is about the fishing part, but uh, we should probably have a, a description of the relation between all that. Typically, the the fact that an attack starts with a bridgehead, which is typically obtained by fishing, but can be obtained by something else and then uh, goes into expansion to uh, eventually try to control the network. And that is something that is important for me, and uh, I'm guilty uh, there of not giving feedback early and providing text to Dominic, but we, we should develop that. And, and it goes to my second point. The reason we want to have this taxonomy of, uh, of attacks is also because we want to have a taxonomy of defenses. For example, if we follow the attack model in which phishing leads to a beachhead, leads to a lateral propagation, uh, then leads to a network compromise, and then leads to all kinds of exploitation, uh, there are different defenses that apply at different points. And so it'd be very interesting to uh, get from the first uh, taxonomy of attacks a second one, which is a taxonomy of defense, but for me, that should be a second step. And I've already spoken too long, so I'll give the floor to whoever wants to speak next. Thanks, Christian. That was really useful. Yeah. 
got a couple of questions and um, I'm, I'm wondering if you can hear me because the setup's weird. We can hear you. Oh, excellent. Um, so I, I think the, the the broad spectrum of threats that we've sort of seen documented in these drafts are, are interesting. And it, the question that I have and the question I've been struggling with is what does the ITF do about some of these? And I think there's there's various contexts in which we do understand what happens, but um, the the protocol design aspects of of this are much less clear to me. And so I'm I'm interested in a concise listing of things that we might uh, concretely suggest as uh, as it goes to your first side of things. Uh, when it comes to something like fishing and uh, the, establishing a beachhead and lateral propagation and, and, and those sorts of things. I think there is work that's going on, but um, I haven't seen a very concise, clear summary of the of the actions that we might then take as a result of that. Would you understand that? But Martin, I, I think I agree with you, and that's the reason why I said it should be a two-stage approach. First, you list, I mean, all the uh, threat, the big attacks that are hanging below our nose, and we, we absolutely have to acknowledge that, otherwise, I mean, there's no credibility in the work. And then, there will be defense against those attacks, and only a fraction of the defense is something that is in the ITF purview. But we, we have to do that in the two-step approach first. I, I think that's reasonable. The, the um... I guess the question is how far you get down the, the path of, of carefully documenting all of these uh, various threats before you, you have to you start to try to work out um, where it is that, that we have some purchase on them and where it is that we've deci decided that simply these are out of scope and will not, will not deal with them. That, that bit is what, what bothers me most, I think. And so I three C is doing, and that, and that's sorry, Ari. Uh, the W three C is doing work on the privacy side of things, and that's a very different thing to what we're, we're talking about here. So I think you you're asking really good questions. I I agree with uh, Christian that, that this two step approach, if I understand his approach correctly, is is probably the right answer for that. And. From my own perspective, I think it's always the case that you have to understand first before you can react or even know if you don't need to react or cannot react. So I think understanding is important, even if like we might possibly not be able to do something in a particular protocol. Regardless of that, the understanding uh, is, is important. Record recognition of issues is important. But but there's a other side of your question, which is that um, it, it's not like one thing that we're documenting. It's like a, 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 a number of different things that we could be looking at. Um, and, and then the question comes, you know, which ones of those we actually want to dig in deeper? I think that, that that's, a, that's a good question to ask. And I don't necessarily have an answer. Um, but we're not going to do document everything that has changed in the internet since you know, 20 years ago. And um, that, that would be too much. Uh, we need to select a particular subset. And that's why I've been calling for this more focused approach. That, that's true. At the same time, there's something that Martin said about the tension between security and privacy. But uh, what we see in a number of those big attacks, like uh, the attack uh, against the Office of Budget Management in the US is uh, the, the fact that the attacks, the goal of the attack is to acquire a personal identification data and database on people that you can then use to uh, break those people's privacy and also to mount further phishing attacks and things like that. So there, there is, I mean, the, the, the relation between security and privacy is not, uh, oh, I mean, in the name of security, you're going to destroy privacy. It's like also the absence of security destroys privacy.
it's, it's Mark again. Can I I'll sort of follow up on something else that Martin said and that that there there would be sort of like a uh, if if we think about Christian's two step approach and that the first step is this sort of taxonomy and I think Martin and not putting words in his mouth but I think one of the things Martin was saying is how far do you go right and that you come up with a list of threats and attacks and to what what point do you have to say look the ITF doesn't respond to some of these or isn't it isn't part of their mission. And I would think that the answer to that question is the things we would only we would only come up with the things that we thought had an impact on protocol design. So the, the threats and attacks that we we want to highlight that give guidance to protocol designers to ensure that those protocol designers are taking those threats and risks and potentially mitigations into consideration. And that's kind of how, in answer to Martin's question, that's kind of how I draw the line. Now I'm hand waving a bit, right? Because I'm not telling you how to do that. But in my mind, the qualitative answer is what we want to do is guide better protocol design from the point of view of security. And, and so anything that falls out of that criteria are things that the IETF wouldn't concern itself with. Yeah, well, I think, Mark, I think you've 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 basically hit it there. Um, so I was thinking originally that this would be um, exactly that sort of um, that sort of advice to protocol designers. So how do you design your your protocol for better security? But when you when you look at the the text that's in BCP thirty eight and thirty five fifty two, whatever that one is, um, that there's a lot there that already already sort of covers that aspect of it. But the the thing that most sort of interest me in terms of a, a, my own blind spot, I, I guess, is the the idea that we potentially design new protocols in response to particular privacy threats or security threats that uh, are a result of the changing landscape. And so the, um, the work that's, that's going on to deal with incident response, for instance, is, a, is an example of that. And, and so I think there's this different reactions that we might have. And some of those are, this is the way that you change the way in which you design protocols to achieve other purposes. And then there's, these are opportunities to do new work in the area that requires cooperation between different, different nodes. Uh, Tommy here. Um, I think that's right. Um, and to just pick up on a point from Martin and Christian, um, I think listing and um, categorizing the threats is important. And I do accept that we don't really know as protocol designers what impact that should have on the protocol design. Um, and it may be that it actually can have very little impact because there's not much that the protocol design can do about it. But I think it would be um, unwise to be ignorant of those threats um, because it may be that the protocol design can actually have quite a lot of um, impact on how effective those threats can be. Um, I mean, just taking Christian's example of um, establishing a bridgehead and then um, an attack propagating through a network that's going from one um, device which has become malicious to other ones moving through. Um, that is really one which is very hard to stop um, with conventional protocol um, design considerations that we may have. But it's one I think we should be considering and studying and working out whether we can um, do things which frustrate that sort of example. Um, so I don't really know answers, but I feel there is study required to um, determine what we should do in protocol design in response to a, you know, quite a systematic survey of, of, of the threats and, you know, the things 
things which are causing damage both security and privacy wise at the moment. So yeah, I'd, I'd support um, sort of continuing to look at that question of um, how you use knowledge of these threats to have impact on your protocol design choices. So I have one more question, um, and that is, is it possible to take Christian's two-step design and, and do a dry run or a trial run of it on, on something that's, that's relatively well understood? So to take the example that Tommy used, the lateral propagation within, within a, a network, you've got the beachhead and you're, you're trying to propagate across into, into other nodes within that network. What what um, what is it that we might um, do in that context, and do a deep dive on something so we can prove that that it, that is tractable, or we can prove that that one is not one that we're interested in? I suspect that we are interested in it, but um, I, that's my suggestion. Is it maybe someone can do a little bit of, bit more of a deep analysis of one of those, and maybe we can have a discussion about that. Yes, I think that's correct. Uh, I am not going to do that analysis now, but uh, stating that we shall have a document going in depth on this particular attack, I mean, the bridgehead problem, it's uh, something we should definitely have a draft before the next meeting. I just wanted to, to say, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to help work on that draft. Um, my, uh, my draft on security protocol design, um, it, what I wanted to do in the next sort of iteration of it is to actually do exactly what you mentioned um, and what you were talking about, Martin, in, and that is to really look in more detail at the the issues and that what is um, impacted, right? What how the protocol design uh, would be impacted by certain security and privacy threats as well. So it's something that I've had on my mind that I haven't um, done in the current iteration, but it, but it's definitely something that I, I want to do. So um, yeah, happy to work on that. Yeah, a possible direction forward here, and when we get in this position, sometimes with uh, traditional working groups, one of the things we do is we go off and form an editing team to go away and and try to meet the needs of multiple authors, right? And I think we could take Martin's suggestion, and if we could come up with a crisp uh, a crisp description of what we were asking from the authors, I'm sure that we would have volunteers from the people who have been authoring drafts for Model T to, to attempt what Martin, um, Martin suggested, um, the sort of deep dive on a specific tractable problem, and then come back to Model T with some documentation of that that comes from perhaps a, 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 a consensus or unified set of the people who have been contributing documents to Model T over time. So sort of like forming an editing team, um, but in this case, to meet the sort of specific, uh, the specific goal that Martin talked about. I do think we need to somehow capture uh, fairly crisply what, how we're going to um, describe that for the editing team, but that would just be a straw proposal for moving forward. Yes, I like that idea. So um and I'm now now wondering a little bit if if we should attempt to do a crisp definition right now um for the benefit of my notes or, or for the recording um 
Christian or uh, Martin or, or you, Mark, would you like to attempt to give us two or three sentences to define what we would like to do? So, I, I don't think we need to, to specify which item that we dive into. I think that um, may, maybe the bridgehead I, uh, problem is the one that we, we get, but I would like to see a, a very uh, concise description of a, a specific type of problem um, and then examine the sorts of responses that, that might be taken to that problem uh, and then take a look at each one of those responses and uh, say what effect that might have on someone uh, who might choose to design a protocol or someone who is designing a protocol for that context. I don't know that that's quite crisp enough though. I think I would say plus one to Martin's suggestion there. I think we could leave it to the editing team to pick what what it was the particular threat or the particular risk that uh, uh, they were going to do the deep dive on. I think what's more important for Model T is being clear about sort of the the, the, the general outline of what we expect um, as as output. And I, I agree with Yari that it could just be two or three sentences. It doesn't have to be more than that. Um, but it needs to be crisp enough so that if we have three or four or five people volunteering to try to produce some work in that space, that they have a common view of what it is they're going to end up producing. The, the reason I like the proposal is because it's concrete. We can start with uh, one specific problem and then get a brainstorm about what could be done. Take the bridgehead problem, there are plenty of things we could brainstorm on. I mean, like uh, what happens with protocols that assume that if you're on the same local network, you're authorized and things like that. And ju just go in one problem, not try to over specify it in advance and see what it gets. It seems better than. Basically, Yari, you're going to write minutes. In the minutes, you can say something that takes a problem, analyze it concretely, and look at various existing mitigation that have been studied in the ITF, look at mitigation that are deployed in the industry, and see what more the ITF could do. That seems reasonable. Thanks. That that does sound good. This is Russ. I don't have a huge amount of time to put into this, but I would be willing to work with uh, you know somebody else to help capture some of that, and uh, certainly uh, you know just make sure we have something as a straw man for the next time we get together. Very good. Thank you, Russ. Okay, so any other things that we should be doing uh, or any other um, points that people want to take up at this stage? Uh, 
I guess not. Um, so why don't we move to the next item on that agenda, which was uh, when should we meet again? And I think it would be useful for a small team to indeed get some results um, before the next call. But since this is a concrete problem and uh, not a, a huge problem, or I mean, it can be hopefully described in a in a, a finite amount of words. Then maybe that could actually happen reasonably fast. So should we ask Steve to schedule us a call in late September? Would that be a reasonable way forward and try and get some progress before that? And then that would leave us uh, time for the next ITF to do another round uh, before that happens and before the deadlines are. Yeah, I think that makes sense, Yari. And I also think we can have, you know, further discussions on the email list, at least initially, to start things off. Thanks. Any other thoughts? And I, I do want to remind people that well, we do need to, uh, I mean, not just have some set of people do stuff, but also the rest of us have to review their their results and also review the other other documentation that we have and uh, in in ITF and outside ITF. We've had some some discussion of those points. Um, so there's work that remains for trying to understand where we are and comment on. Uh, documents today. So it's not just sitting around and waiting for the small team to do stuff. But um, yeah, so team will do things. The rest of us will do things, uh, review and comment, participate in the mailing list. And we will have a call in late September uh, with, uh, based on Doodle poll results that Stephen will initiate. And uh, anything else? Just okay. taking the letter to the RA. Okay. Martin, did you want to say something? I was going to say thank you for staying up late, Yari. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not going to think about what, what, what your time zone is and uh, how late it is for you. Probably even worse. Um, okay, I think we're done. Thank you all. I will send some notes as, as we process the call uh, recording and uh, my brief notes and uh, we'll, we'll get a team set up um, to pursue this particular practical problem and, uh, and then we'll see where we go from there. Thanks all. Thank you, Yoey. Thank you so much. Thank you.